Anyway, the crazy thing is that in 1940, a lot of Jews still didn't know what was happening all around them. Jews were being rounded up and sent to concentration camps, and nobody knew about it. France hadn't passed any anti-Semitic laws yet, so Chagall thought he was okay. It was his daughter, Ida, who basically told him that he needed to get the hell out of France. Thankfully, since he was a well-known artist and had previously shown in the United States, he was actually invited to become a refugee there. In 1941, he took the offer and moved to New York. In New York, he quickly acclimated himself and felt at home with the other Eastern European Jews that were all over the city. Chagall didn't really fit into the American scene right away. It was like everyone knew his work was good, but no one really liked it. Kind of what I first thought of him when I first saw him, to be honest. So, Matisse's kid Pierre was also living in New York at the same time, so he set Chagall up with some huge shows in New York and Chicago. After this validation from the art world, his work became super popular. By 1945, the true horrors of the Holocaust began to become public, and Chagall's hometown of Vitebsk was completely destroyed. This was also the same year his wife Bella died due to a viral infection which wasn't treated because of rationing medicine for the war. In Chagall's mind, Bella was another victim of the Holocaust, albeit in a different manner. Needless to say, he blamed her death on Nazi Germany, and this is something that would stay with him forever. You can see in his works that he is thinking about current events and making his personal story very closely connected to a larger political issue. By 1948, it is now safe to return back to France. So Chagall goes there. He begins an on and off again relationship with a woman named Virginia Haggard. This basically fizzles out and Chagall is once again alone in Paris. His daughter Ida plays matchmaker and introduces him to Vava Brodsky who is also a Russian Jew. The two hit it off and get married very quickly. The ten years following could easily be called the sellout years, and have actually, in my opinion, given Chagall's work a somewhat kitschy feel. It was during this decade that Chagall began painting and selling his work on everything. Pots, pans, jugs, tapestries, curtains, everything you can imagine. It was like he had an account on one of those online shops that asks if you want to put a photo on a coffee mug or a mouse pad. With that being said, I don't think that his work became too kitschy. It's more that Chagall really didn't care about what the established norms of how a painter should act are. Normally a painter gets famous, has shows, sells paintings, and then makes more paintings in a similar style so people don't get too confused. However, Chagall was all over the place, doing sets for ballets, making ceramics, sculptures, all that stuff. In 1963, he got a commission to paint the ceiling of the Opera Hall in France. This created a big controversy because it was a historical building and many people didn't want to see it painted in a non-traditional manner. There was also some underlying xenophobia directed at Chagall, who was a Jewish immigrant painting a historical French monument. To the criticism and xenophobia directed at Chagall, Chagall replied, quote, They really have it in for me. It's amazing the way the French resent foreigners. You live here most of your life. You become a naturalized French citizen, work for nothing decorating their cathedrals, and they still despise you. You are not one of them. Chagall was now 77. He spends a year on his back working on the opera house ceiling. When it opens to the public, the symphony plays Mozart's Jupiter Symphony in his honor. The entire house was dim as Jupiter's symphony played. As the music began to build, the lights came on, and the crowd began to cheer. Chagall's ceiling was a great success, and even the former critics had their mouths shut. It was also during this time that Chagall began making these giant stained glass windows all over the world. During the 70s, Chagall continued to work producing works in various mediums. He lived until 1985, when he died at the age of 98. I'll wrap this up with a quote from author Serena Davies, which I believe succinctly wraps up what an epic life this man truly led. She said, quote, By the time he died in France in 1985, the last surviving master of European modernism, outliving Joan Miro by two years, he had experienced at first hand the high hopes and crushing disappointments of the Russian Revolution, and had witnessed the end of the pale, the near annihilation of European Jewry, and the obliteration of Vitebsk, his hometown, where only 118 
of a population of 240,000 people survived the Second World War. He came from nowhere to achieve worldwide acclaim, yet his fractured relationship with his Jewish identity was unresolved and tragic. He would have died with no Jewish rights had not a Jewish stranger stepped forward and said the Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead, over his coffin. <laughs>